This episode is sponsored by Audible. Audible is a leading provider of spoken word entertainment and audiobooks, and they have over 100,000 titles available for download. Visit audibletrial.com slash the scald circle to begin your trial and download your free audiobook today. It's time to relax, grab a drink, pull up a chair by the hearth, and have a seat in the scald circle to listen to chapters 1 through 6 of the Volsanga Saga, as told by Casimir. Before we begin our story, we want to remind you that we release new stories for free every week. Our shorter tales release on Wednesdays, and our longer chapter stories release every other Saturday. Find out where you can hear them on our website at thescaldcircle.com. And be certain to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Podbean, Spotify, or whatever your favorite podcast app is. That way, you'll never miss out on one of our enchanting tales from around the world. In addition to our reminder, we have some exciting news for the month of July. You've likely noticed that our format sounds a little bit different. Not only that, but you may have heard, in addition to our story releases on Wednesdays, we will also now be releasing longer chapter-length stories every other Saturday. As if that isn't exciting enough, starting on July 9th, we will begin hosting Fireside Stories with the Skull Circle at 7 p.m. Central Time every other Thursday. Our Fireside Stories will be a live stream of my Logan and I regaling you with stories you may have never heard before, along with some of our very own witty banter. So, if you want to experience what a live show from the Skull Circle is like, that may be of interest to you. You can find more details under the events section on our website. The Story of the Volsungs and Niblungs Chapter 1 of Sigi, the Son of Odin Here begins the tale, and tells of a man who was named Sigi, and called of men the son of Odin, another man withal, is told of in the tale. Height Skadi, a great man, and mighty of his hands. Yet was Sigi the mightier, and higher of kin, according to the speech of men of that time. Now, Skate had a thrall, with whom the story must deal somewhat, Brethi by name, who was called after the work which he had do. In prowess and might of hand, he was equal to men who were held of more worthy, yea, and better than of some thereof. Now, it is to be told, on a time, Sigi fared to the hunting of the deer, and the thrall with him, and they hunted deer day long, till the evening, and when they gathered together their prey in the evening, Lo, greater, and more by far, was that which Bredi had slain than Sigi's prey. This thing he much misliked, and he said that great wonder it was that very thrall should outdo him in the hunting of deer. So he fell on him and slew him and buried the body of him thereafter in a snowdrift. Then he went home at evening tide and said that Bredi had ridden away from him into the wild wood. Soon was he out of my sight, says he, and not more I wot of him. Skedi misdoubted the tale of Sigi and Dean that this was a guile of his, and that he would have slain Bredi. So he sent men to seek for him, and to such an end came their seeking, that they found him in a certain snowdrift. Then Skedi, that men should call that snowdrift Bredi's drift from henceforth, and thereafter have folk followed, so that in such wise they call every drift that is right great. Thus it was well seen that Sigi had slain the thrall and murdered him. So he is given forth to be a wolf in holy places, and may no more abide in the land of his father. Therewith Odin bare him fellowship from the land. So long away, that right long it was, and made no stay till he brought him to certain warships. So Sigi falls to lying out a warring with the strength his father gave him, or ever they parted and happy was he in his warring, and ever prevailed, till he was brought about that he won by his wars land and lordship at the last, and thereupon he took to him a noble wife, and became a great and mighty king, and ruled over the land of the Huns, and was the greatest of warriors. He had a son by his wife, who is called Refir, who grew up in his father's house, and soon became of great growth and shapely. Chapter 2 of the birth of Volsung, son of Ravir, 
who was son of Sigi. Now Sigi grew old and had many to envy him, so that at last those turned against him whom he trusted most, yea, even the brothers of his wife, for these fell on him in his unwariest, when there were few with him to withstand them, and brought so many against him that they prevailed against him. And there fell Sigi and all his folk with him. But Rarir his son was not in this trouble, and he brought together so mighty a strength of his friends and the great men of the land that he got to himself both the lands and kingdom of Sigi his father. And so now, when he deems that the feet under him stand firm in his rule, when he calls to mind that which he had against his mother's brother who had slain his father, so the king gathers together a mighty army, and therewith falls on his kinsmen, deeming that if he made their kinship of a small account, yet none the less they had first wrought evil against him. So he wrought his will therein, in that he departed not from strife before he had slain all his father's banesmen, though dreadful the deed seemed in every wise. So now he gets land, lordship, and fee, and it's become a mightier man than his father before him. Much wealth won in war, Gatravir, to himself, and wedded a wife withal, such as he deemed meet for himself. And long they lived together, and had no child to take the heritage after that. And ill content they were both with that, and prayed the gods with heart and soul that they might get them a child. So it is said that Odin hears their prayer, and Freya no less hearkens wherewith they prayed unto her. So she, never lacking for all good counsel, calls to her her casket-bearing maid, the daughter of Hrimnir, the giant, and sets an apple in her hand and bids her bring it to the king. She took the apple and did on the gear of a crow and went flying till she came whereas the king sat on a mound and there she let the apple fall into the lap of the king. But he took the apple and deemed he knew whereto it would avail. So he goes home from the mounds of his own folk, and came to the queen, and some deal of that apple she ate. So as the tales tell, the queen soon knew that she was big with child, but long time wore, and ever she might give birth to the child. So it befell the king must needs go to the wars, after the custom of kings, that he must keep his own land in peace. And in this journey it came to pass that Rabir fell sick and got his death being minded to go home to Odin, a thing much desired of the folk in these days. Now no otherwise, it goes with the queen's sickness than hair to after. Nor may she be the lighter of her child, and six winters wore away with the sickness still heavy on her, so that in the last she feels that she may not live long. Wherefore now she bade cut the child from out of her, and it was done even as she bade. A man-child was it, and great of growth was his birth, as might well be. And they say that the youngling kissed his mother, and ever she died. But to him a name was given, and he is called Volsung. And he was the king over Hunland, in the room of his father. From his early years he was big and strong, and full of daring and manly deeds and trials. And he became the greatest of warriors, and good hap in all battles of his warfaring. Now, when he was fully come to man's estate, Hremnir, the giant, sends to him, Lod, his daughter, she of whom the tale told that she brought the apple to revere Volsung's father. So Volsung weds her, with all, and long they abode together, with good hap and great love. They had ten sons and one daughter, and their eldest son was Heit Sigmund, and their daughter Signy, and these two were twins and an all-wise the foremost and the fairest of the children of Olsung the king, and mighty as all his seeds was, even as had been told long from the ancient days, and tales of long ago, with the greatest fame of all men, how that the Volsungs have been great men in high-minded, and far above the most of men both in cunning and prowess and all things high and mighty. So says the story that King Volsung let build a noble hall in such a wise that a big oak tree stood therein, and that the limbs of the tree blossomed far out over the roof of the hall, while below stood the trunk within, and said the trunk did men call Branstock. Chapter 6
Chapter 3 Of the Sword That Sigmund Volsungsons Drew from Branstock There was a king called Sigir, who ruled over Gotland, a mighty king of many folk. He went to meet Volsung, the king, and prayed him for Signy his daughter to wife. And the king took his talk well, and his sons withal. But she was loth her too, yet she bade her father rule in this as in all other things that concerned her. So the king took such red that he gave her to him, and she was betrothed to King Sigir. And for the fulfilling of the feast and the wedding was King Sigir to come to the house of King Volsung. The king got ready the feast according to his best might, and when all things were ready came the king's guests, and King Sigir with all at the day appointed, and many a man of great account had Sigir with him. They tell tales that great fires were made and long the hall, and that the great tree aforesaid stood midmost thereof. With all folk say, when as men sat by the fires in the evening, a certain man came into the hall, unknown of aspect to all men, and such a like array he had, that over him was a spotted cloak, and he was barefoot, and had linen breeches, knit tight even unto the bone, and he had a sword in his hand. And as he went up to the branstock, and a slouched hat upon his head, huge he was, and seemed ancient and one-eyed. So he drew his sword and smote it into the tree trunk, so that it sank in up to the hilts, and all held back from greeting the man. Then he took up the word and said, Whoso draweth this sword from this stock, shall have the same as a gift from me, and shall find in good sooth that never bear he a better sword in hand than is this. Therewith out went the old man from the hall, and none knew who he was or whither he went. Now men stand up, and none would fain be the last to lay hand on the sword, for they deemed that he would have the best of it who was might first to touch it. So all the noblest went thereto first and then the others, one after the other, but none who came thereto might avail to pull it out. For in no wise would it come away hithersoever they tugged at it. But now comes Sigmund, King Volsung's son, and sets hand to the sword and pulls it from the stock, even as if it lay loose before him, so good that the weapon seemed to all that none thought he had seen such a sword before and Sigir would fain buy it from him at thrice its weight in gold. But Sigmund said, Thou mightest have taken the sword no less than I there whereas it stood, if it had been thy lots to bear it, but now, since it had first of all fallen into my hand, thou shalt never have it, though thou biddest therefore all the gold thou hast. King Sigir grew wroth at these words, and deemed Sigmund had answered him scornfully. But, Whereas was a wary man and double-dealing, he made as if he heeded this matter in no wise. Yet that same evening he thought how he might reward it, as was well seen afterwards. Chapter 4 How King Sigir wedded Signy and baited King Volsung and his son to Gotland. Now, it is to be told that Sigir goes to bed by Signy that night, and the next morning the weather was fair. Then says King Sagir that he would not bide, lest the weather should wax or the sea grow impassable. Nor is it said that Volsung or his sons led at him herein, and that the less, because they saw that he was fain to get him gone from the feast. Nor is it said that Volsung or his sons led at him therein, and that the less, because they saw that he was fain to get him gone from the feast. But now says Signy to her father, I have no will to go away with Sigir, neither does my heart smile upon him. And I wot, by my foreknowledge, and from the fetch of our kin, from this council will great evil fall upon us if this wedding not be speedily undone. Speak in no such wise, daughter, said he, for great shame will it be to him, yea, and to us all to break troth with him. He being sackless and in naught may we trust him, and in no friendship shall we have of him, in these matters are broken off, but he will pay us back in evil wise, as he may, for that alone is seemly to hold truly to troth given. So King Sigir got ready for home, 
and before he went from the feast he bade King Volsung, his father-in-law, come see him in Gotland, and all his sons with him. When as three months should overpass, and to bring such following with him as he would have, as he deemed meet for his honour, and thereby Sigir, the king, pay back for the shortcomings of the wedding feast. In that he would abide thereat, but one night only, a thing not according to the want of men. So King Volsung gave word to come on the day named, and the kinsman-in-law parted, and Sigir went home with his wife. While we were between chapters, we mentioned earlier that this episode is sponsored by Audible. I personally cannot recommend Audible enough. Being able to download titles and listen offline anytime and anywhere is extremely convenient. Recently, I've been listening to Lines of Departure by Marco Close, and it's a real treat. It's also just one of thousands of audiobooks that are available through Audible. If you have any favorite Audible titles, send us a message. We're always looking for new stories to listen to. If you're not already an Audible member, you can visit audibletrial.com slash thescaldcircle to begin your trial and download your free audiobook today. If you sign up and you're not certain what to download right away, don't worry about it. Your credits last for a year, so Audible never makes you feel rushed. Chapter 5 Of the Slaying of King Volsung Now tells the tale of King Volsung and his sons that they go at the time appointed to Gotland at the bidding of King Sigir, and put off from land in three ships, all well manned and having a fair voyage, and made Gotland of late and evening tide. But that same night came Signy and called her father and brothers to a privy talk, and told them what she deemed King Sigir was minded to do, and how that he had drawn together an army no man may meet. And, says she, he is minded to do guilefully by you. Wherefore I bid you get thee gone back again to your own land, and gather together the mightiest power you may, and then come back hither and avenge you. Neither go ye now to your undoing, for ye shall surely fail not to fall by his wiles if ye turn not on him even as I bid you. Then spake Volsung the king, All people and nations shall tell of the word I spake, yet being unborn. Wherein I vowed a vow that I would flee in fear from neither fire nor the sword, even so have I done hitherto, and shall I depart therefrom now, am I old? Yea, withal never shall the maidens mock these my sons at the games, and cry out at them that they fear death. Once alone must all men need die, from that season shall none escape, so my red is that we flee no whither but do the work of our hands in as manly wise as we may. A hundred fights have I fought, and wiles have I more, and wiles have I had less. Yet ever had I the victory, nor shall it ever be heard tell of me that I fled away or prayed for peace. Then Signy wept right sore, and prayed that she might not go back to King Sigir. But King Volsung answered, Thou shalt surely go back to thine husband and abide with him, howsoever it fares with us. So Signy went home, and they abode there that night. But in the morning, as soon as it was day, Volsung bade his men arise and go a land and make them ready for battle. So they went to land, all of them, all armed, and had not long to wait before Sigir fell upon them with all his army. And the fiercest fight there was betwixt them and Sagir cried on his men to the onset all he might. And so the tale tells that King Volsung and his sons went eight times right through Sagir's folk that day, smiting and hewing on either hand. But when they would do so even once again, King Volsung fell amidst his folk and all his men withal, saving his ten sons, for mightier was the power against them than they might withstand. But now all his sons taken, and laid in bonds and led away, and Signy was where with all her father was slain, and her brothers taken and doomed to death. That she called King Sigir apart to talk with her, and said, This I will pray of thee, that thou let not slay my brothers hastily, but let them set a while in the stocks. For home to me comes the saw that says, Sweet to the eye well seen, but longer life I pray not for them, because I wot well, that my prayer will not avail me. Then answered Sagir, 
Thou surely art mad and witless, praying thus for more bail for thy brothers than their present slaying. Yet this I will grant thee, for the better it likes me, the more they must bear, and the longer the pain is, or ever death come to them. Now he let it be done, as she prayed, and a mighty beam was brought, and set on the feet of those ten brethren in a certain place in the wildwood. And there they sit, day long until night. But at midnight, as they sat in the stalks, there came on them a she-wolf from out of the woods. Old she was, and both great and evil of aspect. And the first thing she did was to bite one of those brethren till he died. And then she ate him up with all and went on her way. But the next morning, Signy sent a man to the brethren, even one whom she most trusted, to what of the tidings. And when he came back and he told her that one of them was dead, and great and grievous she deemed it, if they should all fare and likewise, and yet not might she avail them. Soon is the tale told thereof, nine nights together came the she-wolf at midnight, and each night she slew and ate up one of the brethren, until all were dead, save Sigmund only. So now, before the tenth night came, Signy sent that trusty man to Sigmund, her brother, and gave honey unto his hand, bidding him to do it over Sigmund's face, and set a little deal of it in his mouth. And so he went to Sigmund, and did as he was bidden, and then came home again. And so the next night came the she-wolf according her to her want, and would slay him, and eat him, even as his brothers. But now she sniffs the breeze from him, whereas he was anointed with the honey, and licks his face all over with her tongue and then thrusts her tongue into his mouth. No fear had he thereof, but caught the she-wolf's tongue betwixt his teeth, and so hard she pulled back thereat, and pulled herself away so mightily, setting her feet against the stalks, that all was riven asunder, and he ever held so fast that the tongue came away by the roots, and thereof she had her bane. But some men say that this same she-wolf was the mother of King Sagir who had turned herself into this likeness by trolls' lore and witchcraft. Chapter 6 Of How Signy Sent the Children of Her and Sigir to Sigmund Now when as Sigmund is loosed, and the stalks are broken, he dwells in the woods and holds himself there. But Signy sends yet again to what of their tidings, whether Sigmund was alive or no. But when those who were sent came to him, he told them all as it had betide and how things had gone betwixt him and the she-wolf. So they went home and told Signy the tidings. But she goes and finds her brother, and they take counsel in such wise as to make a house underground in the wildwood. And so things go on a while, Signy hiding him there and sending him such things as he needed. But King Sigir deemed that all the Volsungs were dead. Now Sigir had two sons by his wife, whereof it is told that when the eldest was ten winters old, Signy sends him to Sigmund, so that he might give him help, if he would in any wise strive to avenge his father. So the younglings go to the wood, and come late in the evening tide to Sigmund's earthen house. And Sigmund welcomed him in seemly fashion, and said that he should go make ready their bread. But I, said he, will go seek firewood. Therewith he gives the meal bag unto his hands, while he himself went to fetch firing. But when he came back, the youngling had done naught at the bread-making. Then asked Sidman if the bread is ready. Says the youngling, I durst not set hand to meal-sack, because somewhat quick lay in the meal. Now Sigmund deemed he had wotted that the lad was of no such heart, that he would be fain to have him for his fellow. And when he met his sister, Sigmund said that he had come no nigher to the aid of a man, though the youngling were with him. Then Sigmund said, Take him and kill him then, for why should such a one live longer? And even so he did. In this winter wears, and the next winter, Signy sent her next son to Sigmund, and there is no need to make a long tale thereof, for in likewise went all things, and he slew the child by the counsel of Signy. And that is chapters 1 through 6 of the Volsunga Saga from Norse Mythology. Thank you for listening to our story. If you enjoyed it, we recommend taking a look at our Patreon page, as noted in the description below. You can earn great rewards while also supporting us to keep these stories alive for generations to come. 
Also remember to subscribe to us on your podcast app and to leave us a five-star rating if you enjoy this story. A special thank you to Kat for their support this month. Without your contribution, we would not be able to continue these stories and we truly appreciate it. Visit thescaldcircle.com to stay up to date with all of our current events, news, and much more. Not only that, but you can also visit our story archive of every tale we have ever told. It's sorted by origin and region for the convenience of your listening. Thank you for listening to our story. Don't forget, this episode is sponsored by Audible, the leading provider of spoken word entertainment and audiobooks. While this story is over, you can visit audibletrial.com slash thescaldcircle to begin your trial and download your free audiobook today. Let us know what you've listened to recently in Audible via our Facebook page. We're always looking for new recommendations.